Today is our third annual luncheon celebrating all the activity around the, bio, the development of the bioscience industry here in New Orleans. The Bio District is a political subdivision of the state of Louisiana managed by a 15-member board. Uh, it's exciting because what we're trying to do is create both an industry around the university research at LSU Tulane and Xavier and also create an urban place uh, where there is going to be new shopping, new housing, uh, new apartments and just a whole host of uh, improvements to the area. You're a jigsaw puzzle. You have the raw materials. The question is whether you're intentionally going to take advantage of that. The research Triangle was probably the first place in America that did that uh, back in the 60s. Um, you know, six guys, true story, get rained out from a golf game and they're in the country club lamenting the fact that they send their kids to college and they leave. They don't come back after they go to college because there's nothing to do in that Raleigh, uh, Durham, Chapel Hill triangle other than to do tobacco or timber. Uh, and, and those six guys come together. Uh, put together, uh, uh, buy 7,000 acres of land, call it the Research Triangle, create a nonprofit organization, partnered with government leaders, partnered with the three world-class universities there. And today, if you go to there, you will know that the Research Triangle has 40,000 technology jobs, um, is uh, the highest educated and the highest per capita income of any area of the country. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because there was an intentionality, because of civic leadership partnered with government and university leadership that made a decision to change their economy of what they did. More recently in San Diego. San Diego, many of you might remember, is a sleepy naval town. Back in the 1980s with the leadership of the mayor and Wilson, who then became governor, and civic leadership, business leadership, they made a decision to invest in their universities to become uh, focused on technology, and out of that grew Qualcomm and hundreds of other companies that have fundamentally changed the economy of San Diego. That was, again, an intentional decision that didn't happen by accident. In Baltimore, you can go there today and know that Johns Hopkins and the University of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, partnered with Forest City, a private developer, is investing hundreds of millions of dollars to transform the economy of Baltimore. Uh, away from tourism with the Inner Harbor and uh, uh, a traditional harbor into a technology economy and diversify that economy. Um, in Central Florida, Jeb Bush, when he was governor, gave $300 million to the Burnham Research Institute um, to locate a facility uh, in Central Florida, just east of the Orlando airport. He partnered with a private developer who donated 600 acres of land. If you go there today, there's over 15,000 jobs uh, uh, in, in uh, around what is now called Medical City. There's a research institute, there's uh, a medical school, uh, a whole host of investments that have been made. That was an intentional decision by the governor, by Governor Bush, to make an investment to diversify the economy of uh, Central Florida. We lived this in Pittsburgh. How would you like to become a mayor of a city that was once known as hell with the lid off? <laughs> that was Pittsburgh. Some of you might remember Pittsburgh uh, as the industrial center of America. We made the steel and the iron and the glass and a host of other things. In, in the, between 1970 and 1990, we lost 500,000 people left the Pittsburgh region. It was a greater loss than you faced after Katrina, as, as the steel industry was collapsing and people left. And that's why there are so many Steeler fans all over the country, because people were leaving. They couldn't see a future for themselves in the city. And by the early 90s, we were facing the challenge of how do we, how do we transform our economy? And, and the universities and the hospital, Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh, became our partners in that effort. And, and you know, and, the, and, and, and we have fundamentally changed the nature of the city. And our unemployment rate is two times, two points below the national average right now. And the economy of Pittsburgh is very healthy. It took a very difficult 20 years uh, to make that change. Uh, but it, what it did is diversify our economy. And as an example of that, um, is that we partnered with Carnegie Mellon University and built a, a finance, uh, we being the city, financed the building on their campus where uh, 
existing companies could hang their hats to do research. So Google and Microsoft that were doing research at Carnegie Mellon could have a couple people there in an office to work out of. And Google was one of those companies. And um, they put two people there, and they were doing research with Carnegie Mellon. And, and lo and behold, just a couple, uh, just a, less than a mile from the Carnegie Mellon campus was a vacant Nabisco bakery. And Google and CMU were doing big research. They were growing. Google has located 900 jobs into that vacant Nabisco factory. 70% uh, of the, uh, Google's employees either walk or ride a bike to work. 70%. That's where Google made a decision to want to locate. It wasn't that somebody told them to locate there. It's where they located uh, their company. There are hundreds of other startup companies that spun out of CMU. And so really the challenge is, you, you, it's sort of, I would say coal in Pittsburgh, I'll say oil here. You have oil in the ground. You have um, research that goes on. How do you take advantage of that? Uh, how do you commercialize that research? Part of what we did is we created a program very much like the bio uh, district uh, effort that Jim McNamara is heading up, which is the Ben Franklin partnership that put government, the university, um, and the business sector together in a room, financed that this is 25 years old now, that, that is a way to help companies early stage financing to transfer from a, an idea of a, a person to a commercial product. It has been hugely successful. A program really a model for many places in the country. But I mentioned the capital. The good news is that the United States far and away of any place in the world has more venture capital invested. This is rich, ca rich capital. You all understand if you're going to invest in an oil or gas well, there's a risk involved. You might drill and find something, you might not find something. It's the same with investing in technology companies. Are you going to, are you going to hit a home run or is it not going to work? And the, in the United States, we overwhelmingly have more venture capital. There's jobs created in four ways. One is the people that are working in these institutions and how they get trained and how people access those jobs. The second is suppliers, as Jim mentioned. But the third is the, the ability to commercialize that research and get startups. And the fourth is to selectively work with existing companies to attract them here to put, uh, to get, because they want to be involved in that research. Um, how do you finance this? It's an important issue, and it needs to be an issue of government and the private sector and, and the university. It can't just assume that it's going to happen. I mentioned education, how you continue to invest in that, and how you build this. You can build a bio, uh, you can build a medical research facility, and you can build a wall around it. So it doesn't matter where it is, or you can use it to create value in the whole neighborhood. And that's what you heard from David and Bill, of how this gets integrated into, into the Canal Street and the opportunity you have with, uh, 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 with the housing, to, uh, the former housing uh, community that's going to be developed by our, uh, HRI. All that becomes an important opportunity to shape a, an exciting, vibrant place that you've heard about. And so the design of this, of how this gets integrated into the whole community and how you use it as a catalyst becomes the real issue. Um, the, um, you're, you're at a place at a remarkable moment. The world and the rules are changing. You are building a remarkable institution. Jeb Bush put $300 million in a similar kind of thing. Um, cities would die to have this kind of investment you are seeing happen now. You're really, the challenge for you is whether you have the, the will, the community will, to take advantage of this. If all of you here at this lunch stand up and say, this is absolutely critical for the, for the, the health of New Orleans because it creates high value jobs, it diversifies our economy, and it creates a whole different uh, image for New Orleans in a, in a world that's focused on this kind of technology. You have an opportunity to change your destiny. Take advantage of it. Good luck to you. As a former mayor of Pittsburgh, uh, I became mayor at a time in the mid-90s when Pittsburgh was re trying to redefine itself from a, a largely industrial city, the steel capital of the world, to something else. The steel mills were largely being shut down. And 
we partnered with the universities and hospitals in Pittsburgh and over the last 20 years has really transformed our economy and our region. It's birthed about um, the, the technology being developed at the universities, it's about the community coming together around an entrepreneurial spirit, it's about how to reuse old industrial property for a new generation of companies. So it is really create, and with uh, investment here in New Orleans of, uh, of the uh, biomedical district, that whole investment is, represents just a huge opportunity to transform a major part of New Orleans and in some ways the whole region because the kind of jobs created out of this are generally very high value jobs. Where do the college educated, particularly creative folks where are they going to be? Because they are in shortage and they are the absolute most important building block for the future of these companies. Well, CEOs for Cities now does lots of focus groups with these folks and it turns out that uh, basically in these focus groups, two thirds of them are saying we're going to move someplace or stay someplace where we can live the lifestyle we want. This is very significant because 10 years ago they all said we're going to go to Houston because we can get a job there. Even in the midst of this recession, getting a job is trumped by the kind of life I want to lead. And the more creative, the more valuable these folks are, the more they say they want an urban environment. Urban, walkable, downtown, close in neighborhood, history, characterful. These are the things that basically, these are the criteria that the folks who really shape the ability to attract the companies you want to attract look at when they decide whether where they want to stay or go. <clears throat> what to, just to back this up so I have some credibility here, if you look at the, where, the population, the number of folks between 25, 24, 25 and 34 with college educations living in the downtowns or close to the downtowns of a bunch of American cities, you will discover that in between 2000 and 2010, mostly between 2005 and 2010, this number increased by 40% or more in even in Detroit, because Detroit's kind of cool actually in its core. Denver up 25%. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, which is really working hard to retrain, retain, attract these folks, up more than 40%. Meaning lifestyle really attracts these people. They come here and these are the people whom jobs and investment follow. A parallel trend, which we talked a lot about in the master plan, that supports all this <coughs> has to do with demographics. And there's a uh, vice president at the Urban Land Institute who says demographics are destiny, and I think frankly she's right. This basically just tells us we're getting a lot older. What is more important is let's look at who is actually buying and, and renting property these days. Uh, meaning who's making decisions about where they want to live, uh, even if you're not college educated and young and creative. It turns out that in the New Orleans region, probably some, something between 60 and 65 percent of everybody in this region lives in a household with one or two people, no kids, a much higher percentage than 10 or 20 years ago. There are probably more single women making choices about where to rent or where to buy than there are households with two kids, uh, particularly headed by one head of household. For a whole bunch of reasons, there are a lot more people who also want to be urban. That means that in, you don't, in addition to these younger, educated, creative folks, you have lots of other folks who want to live in close-in neighborhoods. That's great because then you can produce the market to create the wonderful, vibrant main streets that really brings these places to life. It was also interesting to look at household size in New Orleans, and basically you're right up there with everybody else in terms of smaller and smaller households. So what is the housing market going to look like going forward? Uh, in 2008, this is, these are national statistics, it may be hard to read the numbers, but basically about a quarter of all housing in this country was multifamily and about 40 some odd percent was single family. Between 2008 and 2030, we're gonna, 50, more than 50% of the housing we're going to need is multifamily and only about 18% is single family. So basically we have more single family than we need, not enough multifamily. This is actually, forget all the other implications, this is very positive news if you're creating a bio district in a one environmentally rich place like New Orleans, and frankly you have a lot of underdeveloped land because it means you have people who want to live in the city, you have land and you have a market that wants to build the kind of cool stuff that will attract the folks who you want to come live here and work here. Uh, if you look at what's happening to values today, 
uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but across the country, urban values are doing much better than suburban values because this housing market I talked about is very real and building very fast. Finally, I want to close on an issue that is close to home here, but I got to talk about it, which is the cost of energy. Uh, there's a lot of data out there that says that it's not $4 or 5 or $6 gas, that energy is going to become much more expensive, and it has to do with the fact there are many more people around the globe who are going to be using the energy, want, seeking the energy that we've enjoyed. So in 2007, about 4% of the world's population was defined as consuming, folks who earn more than about $20,000 a year. By 2025, in real dollar terms, they're going to be about five times well, more than five times as many people, the share will be about five times as big. That means we're going to be competing with a much larger number of people. This, this actually works out about two billion more people for the energy we want to use. What that is going to do is make gasoline, even driving an electric car, much more expensive. Around the country, we don't talk about that, this, this that much in New Orleans, it now caught, people now spend more on gas than they do on food. If you live in a completely auto-dependent, look at the circle, it says walkable, it says, I'm sorry, drivable suburban, where you have no chance for transit and you gotta drive everywhere, you are now spending about a quarter of your disposable income on, on transportation. It's getting close to what you spend on housing. If you are in a city, and that New Orleans qualifies as this, where you can walk to places, maybe you can take transit, you're more like 10%. That's becoming a really significant factor in regional uh, economic development competition. And the fact that New Orleans can offer this lifestyle in the core of the city is one of the things that really makes it competitive for the folks who make an industry like this work. I guess my message is really threefold. I had a chance to lead the master plan effort. And one of the, maybe the most important tenet in the master plan was that New Orleans should, do, should work really hard at creating great partnerships around economic development. Because creating jobs is what will bring people. Bringing back people is what's going to refill the empty lots across this city. Uh, second part of this message is that this is the right time for an initiative like the Bio District. 10, 20 years ago, this would have been pretty tough for New Orleans to do. Today, Bio Districts like this, innovation centers grow because bright young folks want to be, want to be there. They're the real building block. And boy, is New Orleans set up for the kind of lifestyle that these folks are seeking. And they go where they can find the lifestyle. And then they seek out a job. So this is a terrific time for New Orleans to invest in something like this. Third, creating a district like this. is It's not unique to New Orleans. It, okay. It's not unique to New Orleans. Uh, there are quite a number of cities competing for these folks and therefore these jobs and these companies. And they're doing it through partnerships where city, universities, private sector, all invest and do what they each do best. And I'd say uh, the need is here, the opportunity is here, the next real stage is strategic partnerships to really carry this uh, to across the line. I would offer that any great change begins with a vision. Say that again, any great change begins with a vision. And we've had a vision here, um, statement that we've worked with for the bio district over the last uh, almost nearly two years now that was um, not just about creating a physical place but it was also about creating strategic opportunities and strategic investments and moves about economic development educational opportunities job creation and certainly investing in this transformative industry opportunity and we, we use that word several many times throughout is that this is, truly is an opportunity for this transformative uh, economy and industry to take a foothold in New Orleans. You have all the raw ingredients in place, you have the institution, you have the investments going into the hospitals. And so now, how do we move that forward together and to really capitalize on it and leverage it further into the future? So that was our vision statement. Um, again, very similar to what it is today and, and, and hopefully still a guiding force to lead you forward into the future. The vision statement um, has really four primary building blocks that are at its essence and its core. They're people, industry, process, and place. 
Uh, you've heard a lot from Jim and others and, and the other speakers about most of those uh, uh, process industry. I'm going to focus more about the place and being a planner, focus more on the place piece today in my remarks. But I think the key is that these are all interrelated. You can't take one out and, and not have the collective be uh, successful in terms of capturing the opportunity of the bio district moving forward. So let's just take a very quick look. You can't planners. The message here is about urban revitalization and really creating a integrated uh, place for new development, new opportunity, new innovation. Uh, the, the, in, the investment that's going into the new Veterans Administration Hospital as well as the new University Medical Center is over $2.3 billion. The key is how you take that investment and leverage it out into the greater community in terms of jobs, in terms of education, in terms of uh, new retail, new uh, institutional uh, development opportunities. So it's really about how you get people back to work, how you get new jobs created in this economy, uh, this new innovation economy of the 21st century. And clearly what we're seeing across the country is that um, uh, EDS, what we call EDS, education and BEDS, medical facilities, are really economic engines that drive the revitalization of urban areas. And so this is a perfect opportunity to capture that investment that's going into the new hospitals and leverage it out into all these new facilities. And uh, what, what's critical is it's not just about a physical place and a physical plan, it's about all the other uh, interrelated programs that come along with this overall master plan. So again, job training, education, and uh, community development are absolutely key to be able to ultimately have a very successful industry here in New Orleans. I'm very excited about the potential. Um, I, I should say, when I arrived in New Orleans, I thought in some ways I was more excited about New Orleans than a lot of folks were in terms of the fact that New Orleans is at a place where a lot of cities are trying to get. New Orleans went through some pretty tough decades after the, the oil bust in the 80s, but today, it is bright people, creative folks who love walkable streets and history and great music and diversity who are really the building blocks of a strong economic future and New Orleans is very, very competitive for what is really our most important resource today. What you're doing is this is a major, uh, I would say coal coming from Pittsburgh, but a major uh, oil find right here. This is the raw material, this investment, two point two billion dollars in uh, technology oriented uh, uh, institutions like the hospitals and the universities, the underlying research of several hundred million dollars that will be going into that, that's the raw material. How do you take advantage of that to commercialize uh, that research into startup companies or companies uh, like uh, Google or somebody else that will want to be connected to that research and with open facilities here. We see it happening all over the America now, all over the world for that matter. You, you are putting the raw materials in now as a community, uh, the civic, the political and the university leadership need to come together and to build the infrastructure to take advantage of that. What potential do you see for the bio district of New Orleans? Well, uh, the biodistrict uh, bio uh, potential is really to capture uh, job creation. And you know, we found through our study that so many people, educated, well-educated people, graduate, postgraduate, even you know, technically trained uh, students, uh, didn't have opportunities here in New Orleans. They were going to Houston, they were going to Birmingham, they were going to other places. And so what the new hospitals and the associated development now will be that, that center of jobs to keep people in New Orleans, keep uh, people who have grown up here, uh, here at home and they can see a path forward in terms of uh, their, uh, a well-paying job and a future for them. I think you have a wonderful opportunity. You have such a, a remarkable culture. It's very entrepreneurial. Lots of people, young people came here after Katrina uh, to work. Many of them have started companies. You have that history. Now you need to translate that into uh, understanding how you take advantage of this new raw material you have, which is the underlying research and technology of these universities and hospitals. I am encouraged on a statewide wide basis. Uh, we also have strong funding across the state. Our NIH Life Sciences funding has dramatically increased over the last 10 years, uh, particularly due to Board of Regents programs, National Science Foundation programs. Uh, we just got a $20 million uh, clinical translational research grant from NIH. Uh, Xavier's involved in that. Uh, if there's any centerpiece at NIH right now, their highest priority is translational research, getting research from the lab to the patient. 
So I have a tremendous, uh, and also another example, Louisiana Cancer Research Consortium uh, pulled together Tulane, LSU, Xavier, now Pennington, uh, Oshner, uh, now building to try to attempt to get a National uh, Cancer Institute designated center of excellence. Lots of things are happening in the city and the state in the life sciences. That's really where we need to be and, and keep working on and focusing on. Are you encouraged by everything that you've seen and heard here today? I'm terribly encouraged. I'm, it's great that we've got uh, a 500 person luncheon and it's been sold out for over two weeks. <laughs> so I think that's a really good sign that we do have a lot of interest here. A lot of groups are willing to get in, uh, in the tent and work with us. Are you excited about the potential in New Orleans? Obviously, I think you have a wonderful opportunity. You have such a, a remarkable culture. It's very entrepreneurial. Lots of people, young people came here after Katrina uh, to work. Many of them have started companies. You have that history. Now you need to translate that into uh, understanding how you take advantage of this new raw material you have, which is the underlying research and technology of these universities and hospitals. Other states have had success, and the ones that are the most successful are the ones that figure out how to incorporate university research and that activity into the innovation economy and create jobs around, around that type of research and the commercialization of, those com of, the, of, those, uh, of, of that commodity. And that's something that we haven't done here. We haven't added value to the commodity of university research, and that's what the district's going to do and, and hopefully lead the, state to, lead the state to do more of. Are you encouraged about the potential this offers? Oh, I, I get up every day excited uh, to come to work. Uh, th this is an enormous uh, potential. We won't necessarily be the largest uh, in the United States. We're not trying to be. We're trying to be what's good for Louisiana. And, uh, and there are going to be high paying, quality, sustainable jobs throughout the state of Louisiana. If people have questions like more information, what should they do? Uh, go to our website. My, my email is on there. It's uh, biodistrictnewolens.org. Spell it all the way out, biodistrictnewolens.org.